Good afternoon, this is Susan Bryan. I'm the Senior Director for the Greenhouse Project, and welcome to our webinar today, where we're going to unpack a bit the Greenhouse 2.0 initiative. So before we get started, just some real quick housekeeping announcements. The first thing is that everybody is in listen-only mode. So that means that if you need to communicate with us, you'll need to use the question box or the chat feature in which to do so. Um, at the, we are saving some time for the end, so you'll be able to ask your questions. So um, find that uh, question box on the side of your screen and uh, certainly indicate, put your questions in there and we will take those at the end. So looking forward to working with you as we take a look at unpacking the Greenhouse 2.0. And what I thought we would do today is that um, before I tell you what the Greenhouse 2.0 initiative is all about, I thought it was really important to think about why. Why in the world is Greenhouse launching a 2.0 initiative? And so let's consider where we are today. Let's think about the 15,000 nursing homes that are out there. Most of them were built in the uh, late 60s, 70s, and it was fueled really by Medicaid, Medicare, and as there was government funding for nursing homes, then suddenly there was an incredible growth. You can see there's 140% growth uh, in those nine years right there. The reality is they were designed very much for institutional efficiency. They were looking at the hospitals. They were looking at the medical model by which to inform their architecture, their design, their systems and efficiency. I love the quote, or I shouldn't say I love the quote. I actually detest the quote on the top, which was a, um, a quote by a congressman in the late 1970s who was really advocating for nursing home reform. But he called them halfway houses between society and the cemetery for the elderly. Not a very favorable way of putting uh, nursing homes out there. I wish I could say that that has changed and the public perception of nursing homes has changed or the need for oversight of nursing homes has changed. If anybody has seen uh, Senator Grassley's call for greater oversight, and in fact, a $45 million appropriations um, to CMS to encourage oversight of nursing homes to prevent abuse and to ensure that there's better care for those living in those homes, then we recognize that there is a pervasive problem that is existing within nursing homes. And so when you look at kind of a, a public perceptions poll, and you will see exactly what those perceptions are, um, you'll see that, let's look how nurses and hospitals and nursing homes, doctors and drug companies um, are really faring with regards to this. So you can see that nurses, and because I'm a nurse, I kind of feel pretty excited about that. Nurses had a pretty positive public perception. Um, next in line were doctors, and so those physicians were, uh, people feel pretty confident about them. Hospitals were next. Um, and then your drug companies, and in that little yellow box, just above HMOs are nursing homes. So is it any wonder why, when you look at the next slide, what aging adults say, um, whatever happens, please don't let me move. I, I don't want to move into a nursing home. And so when you think about overall in nursing homes across the country, there's an incredible decline in occupancy rates. In fact, I was... Um, just looking at some recent statistics, and we're about, on average, across the country, an 82% occupancy. Yesterday, I happened to be visiting with Leading Age and um, Penny Cook from the Pioneer Network um, was on the phone, as well as Jill Vitale Awesome from the Eden Alternative. And we were getting our heads together, but what struck me 
was um, someone from Leading Age says, yes, I just recently heard that in one state, occupancy, the average occupancy in a state is in the low 60s. Well, that's, that's crazy. That, that's terrible. And so when you look at some top trends um, and concerns that people are sitting with these days, and we heard it yesterday in our meeting with Leading Age. People are concerned about falling reimbursement. People are concerned about the level of um, oversight and regulations in the survey process. People are concerned about healthcare reform. We saw exactly um, in this current administration, um, you know, trying to undo the Affordable Care Act and to try to initiate something else. At the end of the day, there's, there's a lot of chaos with regards to what will we do with regards to healthcare reform? What about workforce and the impending shortages that we're all facing? What about the changing demographics? The reality is the boomers are coming. I happen to be one of them, and there are close to 80 million of us. And I'd like to say that this demographic, we change, we actually stopped a war. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to have a bit to say about what happens with regards to our nursing homes. And then there's the whole convergence of technology. So I've decided with this, um, with our webinar today, that it's not going to just be me giving you information, but I really want to hear from you. So throughout today's webinar, we're going to launch four different polls. We're going to ask you some questions. So here's the first question, and uh, Meg will get it up on our screen. But essentially, as I've put this out here for you, I want to know what keeps you up at night. I've just kind of created what might seem like a dismal picture. But I want you to look at these, uh, what I looked at, perhaps the top four. What's keeping you up at night? What is causing more concern for you and or your organization? So if you would take a moment, uh, the poll is open and I want you to just kind of indicate your top thing that keeps you up at night. Okay, just another couple of seconds and we'll close the poll. All right, let's close it and let's see what we, we came up with. Here are the results. So it looks like the number one thing, wow, very interesting, that workforce uh, shortage and turnover is really what's keeping people up at night. And it's, it looks split pretty equally uh, between the regs and survey, declining occupancy and low reimbursements. So thank you for answering that. So let's just think that everything that I'm here to talk about is from a very negative frame or very dismal. I want to acknowledge all the incredible efforts that have been done by presumably those of you who are on the call and, and nursing homes at large. And the reality is one of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou is, is similar to what is here. We did the best we could with what we knew. But when we knew better, we did better. So I call that culture change. Culture change is what many of us have spent a good portion of our professional lives devoted to making a difference, devoted to some or maybe all of these elements of culture change. And I pulled these bullets of elements of culture change from some research and research kind of quantified these six different elements that people, when they said we're doing some culture change, this is typically what they were referring to. They were making changes in their environment to create a more home-like environment. They were engaged in person-centered care or activities. They were really trying to create a level of empowerment for their staff. They were decentralizing management to create more collaborative uh, cultures. They were really looking at what must we do to create close relationships 
between staff, families, and residents. They were also, there typically was um, continuous quality improvement process associated with it. So on the next uh, slide, I'm gonna give you a real quick history. This is so high level of uh, culture change in the United States. I like to think that culture change, the real impetus came in 1987 when OBRA, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act was introduced. And it really started looking at the psychosocial needs of those living in nursing homes, really wanting to deinstitutionalize nursing homes, creating more of that home-like environment, and really seeking uh, to find the highest practicable level of well-being for all those that were living in nursing homes. In the 1990s, the Eden Alternative and the Pioneer Network were birthed. And, and both of those organizations were culture change organizations really out to convene like-minded organizations in the case of the Pioneer Network to bring people together to talk about culture change and to equip organizations to do it within their organizations. The Eden Alternative partnered with organizations who wanted to really start the process of deinstitutionalizing uh, their, their organizations. Um, in 2003, the Greenhouse Project was born, and I'll speak more to that, obviously, later. So that in 2007, there was a survey conducted where people were asked to self-report on whether or not they were engaged in some level of culture change. 56 of those nursing homes self-reported that they were doing one of those elements, at least one of those elements. In 2009 and 10, a different survey was conducted and that number went from 56% to 85% of nursing homes were self-reporting that they were doing something. Uh, yesterday at my meeting, once again, we were talking about how oftentimes culture change is siloed and that in fact, we could probably look at some efforts that CMS has engaged in to create more person-centered regulations, to really have interpretive guidelines that really was designed to be more about understanding who those people are that are living in these environments. The Affordable Care Act also provided some mandates and incentives that I think at the core of what they are about doing, it was really focusing on improving the quality within those homes. So I'm curious, for those of you on the call, we will now launch our second poll really want to kind of understand what your experiences are here with culture change and going to ask you to kind of rate yourself as, in terms of where you are. When it comes to culture change at your organization, have you fully embraced person-directed care? You're on your way, but have a ways to go. You're just starting that journey. Or transforming the culture has not yet been a priority. So take a, about a minute to answer the poll and then we'll close the poll. All right, we're gonna close the poll and see kind of how everybody on the call is answering. And the survey says, it looks like we've got a pretty close tie between we fully embraced it and we're on our way, but we have a ways to go. With about 12%, uh, the minority of you on the call said it's just not been your priority yet. So let's talk a little bit more uh, specifically about the greenhouse model and move on to the next slide. So it really was in 2003 that I call it a radical ripple, that it wasn't until the Greenhouse Project came along that there was something that happened when those first four homes opened in Tupelo, Mississippi, that created something that was felt in the field of long-term care, that where we are today, I'd like to think it's a tidal wave of change, but certainly we have made some waves in the momentum that has been created with the greenhouse model so that there are 284 greenhouse homes that have opened in 32 different states. We are currently partnered with an additional three states 
and uh, roughly between 100 to 150 homes that are in development. So this change is radical change. It is a paradigm shift. And I think the other word that I like to use when I describe the change that has occurred with greenhouse is that it's comprehensive in nature. And it's where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's not just the physical environment that changes, but important to say how important that physical environment change is to really creating substantive change. But it's what is that philosophical culture that will move into the, the physical environment and then what are the what is the organizational redesign that will need to occur to really make change stick and really make change happen? It's radically disruptive innovation. And I would wager to say that when you think about the last 20 years, what's hit long-term care that has so radically disrupted the environment, I would say it is really the greenhouse model. And it's that intent, the greenhouse model has wanted in that spirit to continue pushing against the status quo that settles for good, good enough. It's important from our perspective to really broaden our reach and deepen the impact, to acknowledge the ageism that um, is occurring, uh, the societal stereotypes, the ageist stereotypes that really has, uh, has marginalized um, elders in general, but more significantly, those in need of long-term care. How can we and, and leverage our lessons learned? Why Greenhouse 2.0? We believe there's a lot of work that needs to be done to take advantage of what we've done and what we've learned so that we are, are truly about eradicating the institutional model, to really eradicate and to scrub the institutional thinking. It's to deinstitutionalize and destigmatize not just the physical environment, but our beliefs and our limiting mindsets that have so enabled the traditional model uh, to prevail. So let's move on and let's talk about, so what in the world is Greenhouse 2.0? Whenever you're talking about launching a new initiative, I can't state enough how important it is to also talk about the leadership that will be essential to take you forward. And I think it is with great pride and pleasure that there is an incredible um, new board that is kind of underneath the, the Greenhouse Project's uh, team leadership. And um, I will not list every, or I will not call out each one, but to say Steve McAlilly, the chairman of our board, is the CEO of uh, Mississippi Methodist Senior Services in Tupelo, Mississippi, as the pioneer who was the first to really grab hold of this radical innovation. He is our chair, our board chair, and he is surrounded by an illustrious group of people and uh, Meg will send out at the end our Greenhouse 2.0 resource directory that will kind of give you a little bit more information on the bios of this incredibly esteemed group of people that uh, I feel, again, very proud of being able to have them serve along with us in really launching our 2.0. So I'm gonna talk about two initiatives uh, today that are part of Greenhouse 2.0. It will be a rather high level, but I hope it will give you enough information so that you're better able to kind of understand what Greenhouse 2.0 is all about. So let's dive deeper on uh, the Greenhouse cultural transformation. So what exactly am I talking about when I'm calling it the Greenhouse cultural transformation? What it is, is a radically transformative paradigm shift. I've mentioned again that it is comprehensive change. It's where we are changing the physical environment, the philosophical culture, and the organizational structure. What I have not alluded to is, is how important sustaining change is. So much has been written about the implementation of change. Little has been done 
and research to talk about what does it take to really sustain change. So we're going to start up and talk about kind of what is it, um, this cultural transformation that is about our core value, that begins with our core values. So cultural transformation, the greenhouse cultural transformation process is rooted and grounded in the greenhouse core values. It's about the physical environment becoming a real home, not just a home-like environment. I don't know about you, but I'd prefer to live in a, a real home. And so we're focused on what does it take to really create um, a physical environment that just speaks to a real home. In addition to that, our philosophical culture is really thinking about what is a meaningful life? And how do we really ensure that people that are living in a real home are able to live lives with meaning and purpose? And last but not least, that organizational redesign is all about what does the empowerment of staff really look like? And so what we are really seeking to do is to create relationship-rich, person-directed living. Obviously, we are all a fan of implementing person-centered practices into our environments. What Greenhouse is really wanting to do is to say a person should not be defined by their care, but they should be able to direct their life. And so we are talking about being in deep knowing relationships that will enable those that are living in the homes to be living life and to be able to direct their life, not just to have their care or even their life centered on them, but to really understand the difference between person-centered care to a relationship-rich, person-directed living. The Greenhouse Project has really honed a transformational process. And I think one thing that we have learned over time that change is a process. It's not a task, a series of tasks, and it's not quick fix behavioral changes. It's not even check the box education, but it really is working through a very intentional phased approach and process for leading change. In addition to that, it's really understanding a change construct, and it has informed all of the education that is part of the, the greenhouse cultural transformation process. And to really think about that education is really critical to success, but it can't be a, a check the box kind of experience. And in order for change to really stick, we have to identify what are the underlying beliefs, the mindsets that need to first change before we have any hope and, or prayer of changing behavior. And then if we don't identify the systems that need to change that will support the new behaviors, um, if you're using the same system with behavioral change, it's not going to stick. So it's important to understand this construct. Let's first identify the underlying beliefs that must change so that we can then move to our behaviors that need to change and then to look at the systems that will need to change in order uh, to sustain the change. So in our process, we are beginning, first of all, with answering the big question, what will it take for this organization to be financially viable? And we have a, a financial feasibility model that has been honed over the years of Greenhouse that has now been adapted to contemplate organizations and household sizes that would be outside the paradigm of a 10 or 12 person home. And so the financial feasibility the feasibility phase is really designed for each organization to kind of determine what will it take for us to really be able to create change, but to make sure that it's going to be financially viable. 
So our goal is to really achieve cultural alignment in this cultural transformation process. It's really asking the question, how did the greenhouse core values get applied to create cultural alignment? So that whatever the organization is, it's really using the frame of the core values and really determining what must happen through this process of change to really um, help us better align to those greenhouse core values. So when you think about what does this radically disruptive innovation look like to those organizations that are you know, really eager to, to bring radical innovation to their communities, but are potentially land or capital constrained to be able to do so. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of what we have done and what we have learned over time. When we began working with greenhouse or organizations that are wanting to do greenhouse, we discovered that change was focused exclusively on those small homes, the greenhouse homes that would be built at some point in time, usually about a three year period of time. And let's say there was a hundred beds, 100 rooms in their traditional community. And of those, 40 of them were going to go into four greenhouse homes. That meant that there were 60 rooms that would remain in their traditional building. So over time, what we discovered was that it was much harder to sustain those four homes of greenhouse when you had 60 rooms that were still pretty much in the traditional paradigm. And so there was a misalignment. So it was probably in 2012 that the Legacy Blueprint was born. And the Legacy Blueprint was really designed to do that cultural alignment and to go back into the legacy building, um, that traditional paradigm and say, how can we um, more aligned to the greenhouse core values that are happening in the greenhouse homes. How can we make sure that the culture in the traditional legacy building is aligned to the culture in the greenhouse homes? So we were going back and doing the legacy blueprint work. And we asked ourselves, so why are we going back? Why wouldn't we work with that traditional organization from the get-go? to seek alignment so that if not all of those um, rooms were going to go into greenhouse homes, we wanted to make sure that we started changing hearts and minds from the beginning and that whatever moved into greenhouse homes and whatever remained in the legacy building, that there would be alignment. And so we were proactive in our approach. In addition to that, we worked with um, the new Jewish home, as they were contemplating one of their three um, communities, the um, Upper West Side of Manhattan was contemplating a, a 30 greenhouse, complete transition into all greenhouse homes. They also had a community in Westchester, uh, New York. And what was important to them at the time, they said, we want cultural alignment no matter where you are living um, in one of the new Jewish homes communities, we want to make sure that we are lining to the greenhouse core values. So we started working with Sarah Newman, and what we discovered is that there were some zoning restrictions so that they were not able to build greenhouse homes proper. But what they were able to do is to do a cultural alignment they did some rather significant renovation to their legacy building, and they have four beautiful small households. And again, they use the greenhouse uh, process, the cultural transformation process, and all of the education to help inform what they did. And they you know, have engaged with us in really thinking about what does this look like from a sustaining process as well. So it's taking these lessons learned and these experiences and thinking how does this get applied to organizations that are not able to do greenhouse. 
The other thing that we've uh, done, we the last year we engaged, probably about a year and a half ago, we engaged in a pilot to determine a, what would a small house certification uh, look like. We had a couple homes in outside Albany, New York. They came to us and they said, we are built pretty much like a greenhouse home, but we are not operating as a greenhouse home. And we, of course, gravitated to your architectural changes, but we didn't focus as much on the philosophical culture and we certainly didn't think about the workforce and how that might need to change to really um, address some of the challenges we're having um, associated with workforce and the associated cost. And so in this pilot process, we have just completed. Um, we've determined that they've engaged in our education. They've engaged in um, a, a level of uh, data that they are, are now, they have been able to achieve the greenhouse trademark by working with us through this process. So who are we looking for? Who is our target? Well, if I were to sum it up, I would say very simply, we are, are really looking to those forward thinking providers. Those people that say, I really want to make a difference. And it may be that you've thought about greenhouse before, but for whatever reason, be it you're, you don't have the land to be able to do it, or you haven't been able to generate the capital to be able to go the distance to be able to make it happen, but you are really wanting to partner with us to be able to go as deeply as possible um, in a cultural transformation process that would lead to differentiating and demonstrable differences in your uh, traditional environment to really create something that is, is going to go the distance and, and do kind of what you have in your heart to do. So let's take a moment and it's time for another poll. And Meg's gonna pull it up here and we'd like to kind of hear from you about what you might be contemplating. If you were to do one more thing to transform your culture, where would you put your focus? Where would you put your energy? All right, I'm going to ask Meg to close the poll and let's see what all of you have been saying. And it looks like, which I think this is pretty incredible, it looks like most of you are really wanting to consider doing all of the above and to recognize, which to me that gets excited, exciting to me because I, I believe that those that are on the phone are, are really feeling that it's not enough to focus on one thing, but to really think about how can we really look at all of the above and how can we really contemplate what the interplay of all of those things would do to really transform our cultures. So let's go on and we're gonna talk about our second big initiative associated with Greenhouse 2.0. And that is our Best Life Memory Care Initiative. And I know we just did a poll, but before I talk about the Best Life Initiative, we're going to launch another poll because I'm really curious to kind of understand where folks are with regards to uh, memory care in their communities. So when it comes to dementia care at your organization, do you have a care concept that you would say is fully person-centered? Are you working to improve your approach to memory care or you really have no formal approach at all? So take a moment to complete the poll. All right, we're gonna close the poll. Those were only three questions, so hopefully that was enough time. 
So it looks like most of you are in the process of improving your approach. Um, but I would say there's about a third of you that really has no formal approach at all. And I think when I think about the harsh reality, we talked about changing demographics. Um, and when I think about kind of the the reality that when this, these are probably old numbers by now, but those people living with dementia will increase from 50 million, this was 2017, to 152 million in 2050. That's a 204% increase. So it's no wonder that most of us are thinking we've got to do more or we don't have much of approach and we better think about something. So when we looked a little more closely within greenhouse homes, there was some research that was done in 2009 and we discovered that the overwhelming majority of those living in greenhouse homes were living with mild to severe cognitive impairment. And if that was the case, then it was the imperative to us, we've got to do better and we've got to really focus our efforts to improve our offering. And while I consider greenhouse best practice for um, offering the best in dementia care, I recognize that if this was our reality, we needed to do more. Because here's the reality. People living with dementia, we talked about ageist stereotypes. When you put a diagnosis of dementia on top of aging, then there's an incredible devaluation that occurs for people living with dementia. And you see the figures here, 50% of those living with dementia say they've experienced some form of, de of abuse. They are treated as less than. Um, I've heard it said many times as I'm working with organizations, oh, it's okay, they won't know the difference. We're going to focus our greenhouse homes on those that don't have cognitive impair impairment because the others with dementia, they won't know the difference. That's devaluation at its core. Segregated environments, we are, are separating them because of that diagnosis of dementia and certainly focused on loss more than really looking at what retained abilities they might have, and objects of pity. Here's the reality. How a person is perceived influences a couple things. It influences how they are treated, and it also influences how that person is, is behaving. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, if they are perceived as different or, de or deviant, it's more likely that they are going to act according to how they are perceived. And if we perceive them as unable to do something, that they've lost that ability, then the more likely they will be unable to do different things. So with Best Life, I think if I were to sum it up, what is Best Life all about? It is... And I, I often say if I were to start a hashtag campaign, it would be hashtag see me. And it is the hashtag campaign to really see the person first before we see the label of dementia, before we define them by their loss instead of their unique and intrinsic worth. So there are four principles associated with best life and uh, the first one is the power of normal. And the power of normal, as you look at this woman right here, what do you see first? Do you see her diagnosis of dementia? Or do you see a woman who actually is able to read, who's actually looking rather comfortable, who's in her own room experiencing an, a high quality of life experience? There is power when we normalize programs and environments that really value the person. The next one is the dignity of risk. And I will tell you, as a nurse who grew up in a time when restraints were best practiced to keep people safe, I can tell you that we have a preoccupation of safety as opposed to allow a person, especially a person living with dementia, to be able to have the dignity of risk taking, to be able to have the human right to make a choice, even if it might be 
a wrong choice, but there is a dignity in risk taking. The next principle is focus on retained abilities. And I can tell you, it's too often that people living with dementia are viewed and defined by their losses instead of their retained abilities. Instead of being able to really to capture the essence of who they are, and even through the end of life, I just believe there, there are opportunities to really tap into a person um, clear to the very end uh, just by holding their hand and to make that human to human connection. And that, that human connection is so important. And to me, that's a retained ability. So focusing instead of on what they've lost, they can't do this anymore, but instead to say, here's what they can do. And here's how we can really enable them to engage meaningfully in life. And last but not least, advocacy. And really understanding our role as clinicians and as a care team and, and really equipping family members to see our role in being advocates uh, for that person and to really standing up to make sure their voices are heard and that we're not just speaking for them, but we're enabling them to speak and to have their voices matter. Those are the uh, four principles that really define best life. And our approach is really about operationalizing those principles to really create vibrant environments where people living with dementia are experiencing meaningful life. Uh, best life is building on the greenhouse core values that I, I referenced earlier. In addition to that, I think partnerships matter. And uh, just as I said earlier, that to launch key initiatives, it's important that you really consider who are the people that you will align with. And so this year to enable uh, the Best Life Initiative to soar and to go to new places, we have partnered with Embodied Labs. Embodied Labs, um, and I, if you're interested, can certainly uh, supply the website, uh, the link to their website, Embodied Labs is virtual reality technology that really enables care teams to embody the person, to have a virtual experience of what it's like to be living with dementia, to really get inside the mind, the brain of that person that's living with dementia. We have incorporated that Embodied Labs VR technology experience into our Best Life initiative so that people going through the um, initiative will be able to uh, experience the VR, uh, virtual reality experience, so that they're able to gain more knowledge, they're able to gain more confidence and empathy as they then go out coupled with this cutting edge education and approach as they support those living with dementia. The other thing that we are going to be implementing this year is our collaboration with Project ECHO. And I could do a whole webinar on the incredible work that Project ECHO is doing to essentially demonopolize knowledge. It's leveraging technology, creating a hub and spokes model where we've got our experts, and in this case, it would be Ann Ellett kind of are the author of the Best Life Approach, and Dr. Al Power, who will be working with us um, to really be our experts in a hub, partnering with our Best Life sites via technology. So monthly Zoom platform uh, webinars where we're able to really do case-based learning, where our spokes sites will be able to present a de-identified case to our hub of experts who would be able to provide some great feedback to ask some questions to help equip the best life site to better be able to um, address the needs that are being expressed by that person living with dementia. The other spoke sites are, are there to listen and learn, knowing that at a subsequent echo, best life echo, they would be able to present their case. In addition to that, um, either Al or Ann or a guest speaker would uh, doing a, be doing a 15-minute didactic presentation on 
what are we learning about some of the best practices associated with uh, dementia? So it's that idea that we sustain the change that we are implementing. And more than that, there's this ongoing growth and learning where peer-to-peer -peer learning is happening, where we're able to tap into um, the experts Whereas Dr. Sanjeev Arora, the founder of Project ECHO, says well, we're able to move knowledge and not people. So in other words, rather than traveling and incurring the cost of travel, we're really able to move knowledge and to really support our best life sites with ongoing learning opportunities. So bringing best life to your community, where we have really focused um, the last two years on getting Best Life integrated into our greenhouse communities and in 2019 have established the path to full integration within greenhouse communities. We are opening it up to other sites that are non-greenhouse sites. We believe that there is something so powerful about the principles associated with Best Life and some of those partnerships that I talked about that we'd love to open it up to other communities that are looking uh, for opportunities that we've got to do more uh, with regards to our approach to memory care. Or well, we're on the path, but we, we want to have something a little more well differentiated or uh, substantiated. I think what I see oftentimes across the country as I get out there is that there are so many people who slap a label on and saying we're doing memory care and it really is not much more than a label and a segregated locked unit. And what's important to us, going back to that slide, that talked about the eradication of institutional models. Guys, there are 15,000 nursing homes out there. And when I think about uh, Senator Grassley's comments or the comments that CMS are, are talking about, we need more oversight and we, we've got to kind of see what's going on, it's like, we've got to do more, we've got to be proactive, we've got to push past the fear and push against those stereotypes to do more. And these are some reasons why Greenhouse is launching 2.0. These are a couple of our signature initiatives as part of the 2.0 initiative. And this is where we are inviting those of you who have interest to kind of join us. So a couple, um, I think we have one more. No, no more polls. I moved that poll. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions right now. Actually, this is you get to ask the questions. I've asked all the questions. And I've shared a lot of information, but really eager for you to kind of say, what questions are you sitting with? And how can we um, really resource you? So I'm just looking at a question here. How do you compare the pros and cons between greenhouse projects and adult foster home care? That's a good question. And I would say there are a lot of similarities. In fact, we've got um, a couple greenhouse homes in Winthrop, Washington, and their licensure is very much, uh, it's not exactly called adult foster care homes, but it is um, the licensure, I think it's called a Adult Family Care Homes, and it's very similar to that. And I think, um, you know, people have asked us about group homes before and the similarities. And I think, you know, the smaller environments and really seeking uh, to really kind of understand the person and really establish community, there are a lot of uh, similarities there. So it looks like I am, here's one, I am forming an intentional family community in Central Virginia. I would like to facilitate the forming of a self-help home for elder care from start to finish. Construction, um, occupant selection, family involvement as possible, staffing, sustainability, operations, et cetera. Well, I think there will be some other opportunities with webinars, I think, you know, to um, reach out to us. We will have um, kind of our web address where you can, and our phone number at the end where you can kind of get in touch with us so you can learn more. Before services were only for for profit, for, for not for profit, I'm sorry, has that changed? Um, so now we have for profit locations. It's really, that's a great question and it's interesting when we first started 
it took a few years before the for-profit community um, started kind of looking at what we were doing. I have a for-profit provider in Arkansas who's just opened his fourth community. He is on our board of directors because he has uh, more greenhouse homes under his belt than any of our other greenhouse communities. He has 31 homes building uh, two more homes. Uh, so 31 homes under his belt. And because of his pioneering efforts, um, there have been a host of other for-profit developers who are coming to us. And in fact, we have a subsequent slide that will talk about a workshop that we were doing really targeting developers who are very much interested in understanding the nuts and bolts of what it would take to develop uh, greenhouse communities. What is the typical staff to resident ratio or nurse to resident ratio? And I'm gonna give you the, um, the ratios for a greenhouse home. So in a typical 10 person home, you have two direct care staff called Shabbosim in a greenhouse home two to 10 on day shift and evening shift, and one to 10 at night. In a 12-person home, you would typically add another person to day shift, so you'd have three to 12 on days, uh, two to 12 on evenings, and one to 12 at nights. With regards to nursing staffing, for a 10-person home, you would have one nurse to two houses, so that's one to 20 on days and evenings, and then typically one to three on nights. For the 12-person um, homes, you would have one nurse to two homes on days and evenings, and one to three houses on the, on the evening. For legacy homes, is there a certification from Greenhouse received under 2.0? That's a great question. and. Um, you know, right now we are kind of working, what does that brand look like? What does, um, and for right now, it's it's kind of a powered by greenhouse and we are, are working with some organizations as we kind of um, pilot what that looks like. We This is where our board is really thinking about what, what can we do to really provide that level of designation to kind of the legacy traditional buildings and uh, what, what will we call it and how do we not, or how do we ensure that we don't create customer confusion to understanding what's greenhouse and what's greenhouse like or light, I should say. And um, so it, that's kind of a, a work in progress. I mean, I think what we have said is cultural transformation powered by greenhouse for right now. What role does individual economics play in gaining access to a greenhouse home for seniors? Uh, great question, and if I understand the question, I'm assuming that you're speaking from a consumer perspective. Um, is this a model that if I have the wherewithal to pay privately, then a greenhouse model works for me? That's how I'm interpreting the question. And it's really important to us, which is why I put the slide up there that talked about establishing the financial viability and feasibility of a project. It's important to us that we not create a model that is just for people who have the wherewithal to pay privately. That having been said, with shrinking um, dollars in the healthcare system, we have to acknowledge that getting the payer mix right is really important to economic success and viability. Um, when we did a, a financial survey in 2017, it was the median for uh, those living in greenhouse homes supported by Medicaid was about 42, 43%. So not quite half, but made me feel good that um, we were not overwhelmingly all private pay or all Medicare even, but that there was a significant number of elders that are supported by Medicaid that were able to live there. Are there lending service providers who offer programs specifically for greenhouse projects? It's really interesting. We've had some really very specialized programs um, and really sought to our previous greenhouse, previous home, uh, Capital Impact Partners. We uh, worked with them to kind of create those lending vehicles um, and financing vehicles that would make it work. Um, 
most efficiently. We are continuing to partner with others so that we kind of broaden our base of uh, lending opportunities and financing packages that would make a more competitive package to, to make the financing and, and so forth um, more realistic and, and make your project more viable. How about disabled adults? Many uh, residents with Downs, um, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Um, many residents with Downs are living much longer and are no longer able, um, are no longer suited to traditional residential arrangements. You're absolutely right. And in fact, um, we have partnered in the past, um, starting early in my tenure in 2008, we were partnering with a group um, of folks in uh, South Florida that were trying to bring this model to the developmental disability community. Unfortunately, they didn't get zoning to do it, so that one fell off the wagon. We are now partnering with the state of Wyoming um, to kind of replace their traditional nursing home with 10 greenhouse homes, some of which will be targeting the developmental disability population of people, recognizing, to your point, that this is an aging population of people that will need um, a level of support, and this is a model that is really intended to help to support them. So I can do probably one more, and then we need to probably end our call. How big are the small homes in your pilot program? And by big in our pilot program, so with regards to the small house certification that they were actually, they are actually able to wear the trademark, the greenhouse full trademark, um, those homes were 12, two homes of 12 elders, and, and really look very much like any other greenhouse home, architecturally speaking. It was really the philosophical culture that needed to be shifted. Um, that having been said, with some of the other um, traditional environments, we are working with a group in Florida. They are building 16-person households. They will not be fully trademarked greenhouse homes, but it's kind of this powered by greenhouse. And what the CEO here said was that we we want your cultural transformation process. We we love the education and the lessons uh, learned that you have, and um, that's how we want to work with you. All right. Any idea of reasonable cost of room, kind of a, a per room cost? That is so highly variable, and um, if you want to learn more, we're going to be uh, doing kind of uh, making the business case webinar series where we're going to be doing some case studies and showing some of the variability and the factors that impact the cost. So with that, I'm going to um, have us go on to the last slides. We're just about at the top of the hour. We're going to keep these series going. Um, we will the, the Best Life series continues on May 21. I talked at such a high level about the power of normal. Ann Ellett is going to do a webinar that really unpacks the power of normal. And what does it really mean to normalize our programs in our environments? How do you operationalize that? And then we're going to launch our workforce series Secrets to Recruiting and Retaining the Best. And I, I would say, just judging by the poll, that this would likely be something that most of you will be interested in hearing. Really excited to have Lori Porter, um, who knows a bit about, uh, you know, really equipping the direct care staff to, 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 to feel valued and to feel empowered and to really understand how and where, what do we need to do to recruit and retain the best. And our cultural transformation series, Marla DeVries, our Director of Education and Resource Development, she's gonna dive more deeply into cultural transformation. I covered things at a really high, high level, and she's going to go a little bit more deeply to really unpack it. I talked about our process for change. She's going to look at those phases and talk more about it. She's going to talk more about what it means to not just implement well, but to sustain well. So join Marla on June 4 at 3 o'clock for the webinar on cultural transformation. And we will be letting you know when the Making the Business Case webinar series will start, uh, likely in June or July. 
And our next slide is, um, last but not least, we have an upcoming workshop in Loveland, Colorado. If you're in the western part of the country, May 22 and 23, you can visit our website for more information on getting registered for either a webinar or that workshop. Follow us. We are on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And um, let's keep the conversation going there. And last but not least, you can take a look at our website, thegreenhealthproject.org. And we've got an email inquiry line. If you didn't get your question answered and you've got some burning questions, please feel free to email us or give us a call at 410-246-3806. I want to thank everybody for your participation, for your attention, and uh, we look forward to making meaningful difference with you in the future. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care and, and have a lovely day.